Hey everybody, and welcome to a new month here on uh, the Dark Parade. I am Bo, your host for these proceedings, and this month is going to be a little bit special in that we are certainly going on a theme for the month of April, and that is going to be 80s horror, more specifically uh, like 80s slasher horror, which is not necessarily my jam. If you've ever followed me on other podcasts in the past, you'll know that I have a little bit of a kind of a knee-jerk aversion to slashers because of the formulaic nature of them, which is ironic because one of the two movies that I've had produced from screenplays I've written, one of those is a slasher. If you've ever seen Lost After Dark, that was written by me. And it is very much a slasher. It tries to be a little bit subversive in the world of, of slashers, but it is at heart a slasher. It is certainly addressing the formula, if not following the formula uh, specifically. So... I have a little bit of a love-hate relationship with with slasher movies as a result of that. And I selected a handful of movies, not necessarily because I really love them, but because I kind of wanted to dig into them and learn more about them. And we are starting, uh, because it is early April, we are starting with April Fool's Day. In fact, as I record this, it is April Fool's Day, even though the show itself has already been recorded. And I think you're going to enjoy the conversation that I had with Gary Hill about this movie. It is uh, uh, an interesting film. And uh, we kind of get into, you know, why is this movie a little bit different from from other slashers? Not just because it kind of came late in the cycle. You know, April Fool's Day came out around 1986. And that's eight to six years after sort of the height of... The slasher, you know, 78 is is Halloween, 80 is uh, Friday the 13th, and then from 80 to 84, you really had the big rush. And 86 feels a little late uh, for slashers for me, but, um, you know, there is a very much a reason that this movie exists, and uh, we get into all of that as well as what the original endings were, and does the ending work, uh, that kind of thing. So, as always, I hope that you you find you get a little bit of information about this movie that perhaps you didn't have uh, going into it. And, and uh, you know, I like to do um, as much of a critical study of these movies as I can while still having a good time and goofing off. So, uh, at any rate, no further ado, let's get to Gary and the, the conversation about April Fool's Day. Thank you very much uh, for joining us on this uh, retrospective series this month. And uh, as always, let me know uh, if there is something you would like covered. I, I'm I'm basically uh, have chosen the movies through June, and so on the back end of this year, if there are general themes or, or specific movies that you would like to get this kind of treatment, uh, you can find me on Facebook. Uh, over at the Dark Parade Facebook group, or you can also hit me on Twitter at Dark Parade Pod. And if neither of those things uh, tickle your fancy, you can also just email me at Bo, that's B O, at legionpodcasts.com. And uh, let me know what it is that you would like to hear on the Dark Parade. So uh, without further ado, uh, here we go. Here's uh, me and Gary talking about April Fool's Day. All right, folks, uh, as promised, returning champion Gary Hill is back. Uh, this is a new month here for uh, the the Dark Parade. And as such, uh, we are getting into uh, some, some business. We're getting into some 80s horror, which we haven't really, you know, we've covered some, but mostly in terms of like a series like uh, Night of the Demons and that kind of thing. But just a doing a broad swath of just 80s and mostly slashers to be fair um and we we haven't really done and i to be honest gary when i picked these movies for this month it was largely because i felt like i should watch them again and not because i am one of them is kind of near and dear to my heart but everything else was like i feel like this is just something that I want to cover at some point and, you know, 
<laughs> why why wait? And so that's where this list of movies came from. We're starting off with April Fool's Day. And so uh, to begin with, thank you for doing it. And second of all, uh, what is your background with this movie? What, what What's your history with it? I may have seen it one time in full and like spots on cable like a little bit on HBO a little bit probably watched part of it on Joe Bob uh, Monster Vision um, part of it on USA Apple now you watch these things in spurts Mm -hmm. especially when ones that that, we'll get into it but you know ones that aren't you know all the way it's it's not it's not a huge favorite I get it but it it always had one of those endings that that turned me off a little bit but I, I I liked it a lot of this time around I just never went back to it a ton but I uh much like this and you're doing Hell Knight in this series and I kind of really wanted Hell Knight just to give her a redemption watch you know because <laughs> sometimes when you want something again it, it it makes you feel a little different than you did when you first watched it and yeah. I had a much better time with this this time around than I did last time yeah I recommend it I mean we'll talk about Hell Knight towards the end of the month but um, yeah, I I recently rewatched that again in preparation for you know recording that episode, and you know it's I, I'll get into it on that episode, but it's a real hometown favorite for me. I don't think it's the best movie we're going to cover this month, but it is the one that I have the most affection for. Um, but just to give a little bit of the the bona fides of this movie like this came out in 86 it was produced by frank mancuso jr who produced a lot of the friday the 13th movies and so it kind of has a pedigree and better yet the charles uh bernstein the the guy who did the music did the music for like the the original nightmare on elm street and that kind of thing like there are a number of people in the cast and crew that know how to make a horror movie and you know and speaking of uh friday the 13th you know you've got amy Steele from friday 2 who had already been in friday the 13th part 2 when she made this movie and so there's uh, like an interesting kind of uh, like uh, the, on paper this movie should be a better film i think and we'll get into kind of the reasons why that maybe it wasn't, but um, I remember seeing this forever ago, and then of course in the past week I've seen it like three times, uh, <laughs> as well as you know listen to the director, you know, kind of wax poetic about the movie and that kind of thing. Um, I think it looks really good. Um, the uh, Charles Minsky is the guy who who was. Uh, DP on this movie or cinematographer for this movie and it looks a little bit better than a lot of the the crop of especially the early 80s stuff which in fairness was largely independent and this was you know a not a big movie but it was a studio movie and oh yeah it, it looks very good better than most of us last because said this is made by Paramount so I think a little bit of money went into it yeah considering the success of that they had with the friday 13 series yeah and and i think that's one of the things that makes it kind of interesting is it feels you know one all right so one of the things that the director fred walton said about the movie is you know he was not necessarily a fan of horror movies but the idea that there was kind of a comic bent to this one is what appealed to him and i think kind of from jump that is the movie like it it has a very silly kind of vibe to it um like from the time you know you get the the initial credit stuff with um (laughs) muffy saint john and uh you know the the april fool's day party and the you know monster inside the jack of the box and that kind of thing but beyond that you know the first real scene of the movie is this scene at the dock where all these kids are showing up and it's kind of a weird who's who of the 80s you know like 
um, Ken Olent from uh, Summer School. You've got Deborah Foreman, uh, or uh, oh, she's Muffy, sorry. Um, Deborah Goodrich, who uh, plays Nikki and was on like soap operas and stuff in the 80s. Yeah. Um, and as well as being in just one of the guys as the girl yeah. that had the hots for the girl who was a guy. Where, where do you get off having tits, Bo? Come on now. Right. That, uh... and, <laughs> and, you know, we talked about Amy Steele, who was in Friday the 13th Part 2. Um, you've got Tom Wilson from Back to the Future. This this guy's name is Arch Cummings in this movie. Now, yeah, sure. Uh, how Tom Wilson has not avoided playing a guy called Chuck Steak yet, I have no idea. But it, it, it's... Yeah. Uh, yeah, amazing. <laughs> Slice Porterhouse. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and uh, who am I leaving out? There's Deborah Goodrich as Nikki. You've got uh, Leah Pinsent as Nan, uh, who's kind of the new girl in the group. And she's actually been around for a while uh, and, and is still, you know, working. Like, she's got credits as of this year. Did I have to give her a shout out because it's a film that again I saw on cable a bunch and I still watch today. Um, what's the guy's Le- Le- Jeff Lieberman's mm-hmm. Remote Control with her and Kevin Dillon, where videotapes are killing people and it's a uh, it's it's very eighties but very delightful to watch. You know, <laughs> aside from Remote Control, a a modern classic which I'm sure we'll get around to at some point. Uh, Clayton Roner is Chaz who has been in every television show since, you know, from, from like 1985 to 1995. And he's still doing stuff. Like, he's been in Ozark and stuff like that. Uh, was, and, and also just one of the guys as well. Absolutely. Was also in The Human Centipede 3? What? Yeah. That's nuts. Which I have never seen and, and likely never will. Um, but yeah, so it's it's got... A cast, and even Fred Walton, the director, said, you know, up front, like, hey, the best thing that we had going for us was a cast of of really good young actors who were all sort of mid to late 20s. And anyway, but so they show up on this dock because they are headed to the home of Muffy St. John for an, an April Fool's Day party. They're all kids from Vassar. And... You know, uh, they all kind of have their stereotypes. Um, Chaz, the the Clayton Roner character, is sort of the cut up. Um, you've got um, Nikki, who's Deborah Goodrich, who is kind of the sex pot of the movie, and Amy Steele as Kit, who's sort of the final girl you know like nobody's really chased or anything in this movie but you know she's definitely the most serious minded i think of all the girls um and then you know tom tom wilson as arch that you you point out he's kind of also a cut up along with chess but all the guys are kind of dopes you know <laughs> like there's no uh th- uh, oh, what what is the uh, Skip Griffin O'Neill's character? The one that's just coming to this uh, party because he is the cousin of Muffy and wants to get uh, a job out of this is kind of his bag. But you know, it's it's just a, an excuse to get all these attractive young people together on a pier and then ultimately to an island so that you can get them killed. Yeah, it's a great setup. You know, you go to this, this island, it's isolated. It's the last ferry of, of the weekend, so there's no way off of the island either. And it's a great setup for for murdering, you know, on their way to grad school, which I, I, I can appreciate about this movie is that they don't say, hey, these are teenagers and they're doing their thing. Like, no, they say, like, they've been in college for a few years already and, and they, they say that they're older. I can appreciate that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, I, I do like that as well, that these aren't just, you know, kids partying. I mean, they are partying, but, you know, they're, they're going to their rich friend's house 
to have a, a weekend getaway, which uh, I, I haven't exactly done that, but I've done that sort of college, hey, we're all going to take off for a weekend and go somewhere else. So, like, that part of it, I, I, I feel, is authentic in a way that some of these movies aren't. And But anyway, as they're goofing off uh, on, on the pier, they, uh, Ken Olin's character... Uh, Rob and uh, his buddy um, Rob is no Rob is Rob is Ken Oland and then it's uh, Harvey I think is his pal at any yeah, rate that sounds right yeah they <laughs> they show up and you know are almost late for the ferry they they jump on um, during the process of getting to the island um, Arch and his buddy pull this prank where he throws a knife and it looks like it goes in the guy's gut and he falls off the ferry and another dude one, the guy that works on the ferry jumps in after him but it turns out it's just you know this appliance that he wore on his stomach and he's there he's like april fools a good gag everybody and so kind of head scratchingly the guy who works on the boat is like, hey, I got to tie the boat up anyway when we get to the dock. So I'm just not going to climb out of the water. <laughs> I'm just going to hang out and wait for this boat to uh, head to shore. And uh, one thing leads to another. He gets kind of trapped in between the boat and the, um, the dock and gets too horribly injured. And so they've got to take this guy back to the hospital and leave all these kids, you know, stranded on the island. But the movie, in theory, has drawn first blood because uh, yeah. our local knucklehead Buck has been wounded. Horseplay turns to eye trauma. So <laughs> right. it's, it's, it's sort of uh, Italian in a way, see, you know? <laughs> yeah, it, so... Once they all get on the island, we we meet Muffy again, who is uh, played by uh, Deborah Foreman, who was in Valley Girl, uh, the original Valley Girl. Although I think she cameos in the uh, the remake. I never saw that, but I saw that she was listed in the, uh, yes. the cast. Me uh, too. I, I didn't go there either. <laughs> yeah, there's just no point. Like it, the original Valley Girl is really fun for what it is, and it's a, a pretty fun early Nicolas Cage performance. But that's all you need to know about Valley Girl. Um, but yeah, so Muffy, in the spirit of April Fool's Day, because it's her favorite holiday, apparently, um, for, like from Jump, is just screwing with everybody else that showed up, where. Like, she proposes a toast at one point uh, when they have a big dinner, and it's their dribble glasses that, you know, run down to the front of everybody's shirt. It's like, I get that what you're going for here, Muffy, but also, I just want to have a sip of champagne, man. I don't need everything on this island to be a joke. Because there's that, like, Nan is sitting on whoopee cushions. There's exploding cigars. Tom Wilson tries to have a seat and falls ass over tea kettle because it, it's got some kind of spring loaded thing to make him fall backwards. A couple it, times this movie does that. He falls in the, the, the false chair. Yeah. That, the repetition of that, I think is actually pretty funny when, when it happens the second time, I was like, okay, I, I'll, I'll give that one to you. Uh, April Fool's day. Um, and there's, what else? There's the the audio tape of a baby crying in one of the closets. Yeah. Um, Which leads to a whole plot point or about an abortion, the secret abortion or something. It goes, you know, somewhere that it goes nowhere. Right. There. And yeah. So. And I get. Let's just get get it out of the way because as we're talking about this, and obviously we'll be spoiling April Fool's Day. So if you've never seen it and have an interest in doing so, then, uh, you know, th you, you would want to pull the ripcord now, but the original movie, um, had a very different ending where after you get the initial gag that, Oh, like all of this has been a setup. 
then Rob, Kit, Chaz, and Nikki wait for that reveal to happen and then sneak back into the house to kind of get back at Muffy. And Skip, though, flips out and actually tries to kill her. And there's this whole... Like, it, it's th this whole act of the movie that just never happens. And I think that the stuff like the abortion and that kind of thing is... Like, that is leading up to, oh shit, once we know the, the real deal, which is Muffy is fucking with us, we're going to get back at her. And that never happens in this movie, but in the actual original cut of the movie, it did, but the studio saw it and was like, oh wow, this movie get, gets pretty dark at the end, huh? And they were like, yeah, it sure does. And they were like, yeah, 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 cut all that out. We don't want it to be a, a dark ending. <laughs> yeah um but yeah there's like uh uh one of the one of the kids finds hair uh like a heroin kit which is sort of an allusion to a drug problem um anyway but it like eventually i think it's skip who goes down to the dock and and in theory gets got by some killer on the island and that's to have this movie work, you can't actually see people get murdered. Yes. The downside of a movie like this is you're kind of there to watch people get murdered. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I'll give it to it. You know, I watch it this time around, which has been a long time since I watched it, because, because it's got one of those endings, which I prefer the alternate ending. Yeah, I, I wish something would have to happen, because... The, the, the end, and, I, and I'm not sure where they would have cut that off. Would they cut off with the reveal that this is all a joke, and somebody loses their mind there, or well, would they just they they find that it's a joke after they go crazy? I I, I don't know where they where that where that would have came in. Yeah, well, it it happens. At, basically, the movie goes up to the point you see where like they're all in the room and Muffy reveals like, oh yeah, no, it turns out that the guy who's the sheriff is actually my uncle and skips actually my brother and that kind of thing. So all of that happens in the original cut as well. It's just See, that, that that wouldn't work for me. I, I would have preferred if they didn't find that out and then they find that out later. I think that that would work really fine. I think, you know, right. Yeah. And he had that. Oh, like, wow. But this is all for nothing. You know, kind of deal, you know? Well, <laughs> here's what I like about this is, it starts setting Kit up as kind of your final girl mm -hmm. um, because she's the first one to see Skip's body floating under the pier or whatever and freaks out and tells everybody like, hey, you know, he's been he's been murdered. And then um, Tom Wilson gets like caught up in a noose. Uh, like it basically, uh, what are those called? Those rope traps, you know, where it grabs yeah. you by the ankle and, and pulls you up and there's a snake hissing at him and whatnot. And yeah, the, the snake was not, not known apparently in the, in the, her, 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 uh, intricate plot. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's just, it, you got assaulted by a random snake. Um, and he ends up uh like you we just see a figure approach him and the assumption is like oh he's been caught and killed by this killer that's loose on the island um nan goes missing as well i can't remember what her murder was that well and that's the thing is because everything kind of takes place off screen a lot of it is just like oh they're creeping around and then oh my goodness there's somebody in front of me and there's some repetition of that, um, which is kind of a bummer, you know? Uh, again, you come to these movies sort of darkly for the reason of like, hey, I want to see some effects work. Like, that's what a lot of these slashers are known for, you know, thanks to people like Tom Savini, who made these movies popular by making them incredibly gruesome. And the fact that there is little to no gore at all in this movie is kind of a thing and it's one of the reasons that it ended up 
being on TV so much is because you didn't have to cut that much out of it. This is true. It's true. I mean, um, even when uh, Deborah Goodrich and um, Clayton Ron or their characters are doing the deed, which is looks the most like the most uncomfortable sex that I've seen ever seen in my life, uh, you don't see any flesh, but like some legs sticking out. <laughs> so. Yeah, that, uh, you can leave that in, no problem. <laughs> yeah, Fred Walton was talking about that uh, and how the weird angle that her leg is, is at. And he was like, that's just because she was a dancer. Like, she's that kind of limber. And so we thought it would be kind of funny to have this really, like, awkward uh, kind of angle. But yeah, that's all, apparently, all, all natural. Uh, um, that's wild. Yeah, right. And, um,. So there, there's a point where Nikki, speaking of Deborah Goodrich, she ends up falling into the well where she finds, in theory, the heads of Arch and Skip and also Nan's body. And so at that point, it's like, oh, no, there's actually a killer loose on the island. We need to call for help. But they essentially call out to the mainland. Um, are going to call to the, the mainland, but they find that the, all the phone lines are dead and there's no way to get off the island until the weekend is done. That, that's probably the biggest part of the way I like is that there's no way off the island. C- kind of like, um, what's the Arnie movie? In, uh, Arnie and Sly, Escape Plan, where the prison's on, on a boat in the middle of the ocean. There's yeah. no way to get away, you know? Yeah, or slasher season four is oh. kind of the same setup as well that's your that's yours and duncan's thing i haven't watched any of those <laughs> you, i mean you shouldn't <laughs> but yeah it it is that thing of like okay we're gonna trap a bunch of people on an island with no way off and it's a good idea you know it's a good premise and and the setup is fine um but you know we'll we'll talk about it in a minute as far as the okay. execution goes but um, but basically, everybody gets picked off with the exception of Kit and Rob, which is the Ken Olin character and Amy Steele. And, like, uh, Nikki's boyfriend gets... He's laying around with a gimp mask on, and she comes back in the room and he's, like, holding his dick. Okay, if you had your dick cut off... There'd be a lot more bleeding than that, especially because he's ready for love. You know what I'm saying? Right. You know? A lot more blood. And also, <laughs> it's just hard to believe that you're not going to hear something out of the guy when that happens. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, it worked for Bobby. You know, she, she, she cut off when he was fucking sleeping, supposedly. And just that's, uh, but you know the rest of the story. But Sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, with everybody else kind of gone, and also. Throughout the movie, you've seen Muffy kind of staring out the window and acting kind of crazy and out of it. Mm-hmm. And they're like, I wonder what's going on with, with Muffy. And, oh, she's selling it, man. She's selling it for sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so Kit and Rob start investigating the house because they're like, something's going on and, and we've got to get to the bottom of it because there's no way off the island. We can't find any of our friends or the ones that we found appear to be dead. And they believe that because of some markings on a wall with both Muffy and Buffy, as well as finding some paperwork, it appears as if Muffy had a twin sister named Buffy who was crazy and was sent to an institution. And the idea is that, oh, she has escaped, come to this island, and that ever ever since the first night, like it was the real Muffy on night one, but then Buffy killed Muffy, assumed her identity, and has been picking people off, as confirmed by, in theory, the head of the actual Muffy that they find in the attic or whatever. So that yeah, it, it, it's 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 a strange plot point and. It shows up again in the end, and we'll, we'll talk about that, I'm sure. Right. So <laughs> so then, you know, I'm putting this in air quotes, but Buffy then discovers that they, 
they are now uh, uh, have discovered her secret and starts chasing them around with a butcher knife and they end up getting separated so that you know Kit and uh, Rob are basically running different directions in the house and Kit goes into the, the living room where she like flings open the doors and everybody from the movie is just sitting around kind of pleasantly talking and having a drink. And she's like, what the fuck is going on here? And behind her comes and again, in air quotes, Buffy with her knife and then points out like, Oh, this knife is actually fake. It's got, you know, a false tip. And I, I, the thing I like most, I think, about this movie is this reveal because of how good Amy Steele is at sort of conveying this, like, terror and confusion of, I thought it was about to be murdered, and now I just don't understand what's going on. And, yeah. Yeah, and then everything, everything is explained, and, you know... <laughs> Right, yeah, and so yeah, they, that's that's where that's where I got turned off on my initial watch of this movie long ago. Was this this ending to this movie that you think is a slasher movie, but it's not really a slasher movie. It's just kind of like, hey, this is fucking clown shoes. I was like, okay, I'll go watch Friday Part Four again and be done with it. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean that's I also kind of the problem that i have with it is that it's it's like when you, you watch a movie that turns out to all be a dream you know where you're like well then what what was the point of all that if i'm not emotionally invested in any of this like it you know you pulled the rug out from under me i, I gotta reiterate that's that's 12 year old me talking me, me not liking that twist of this movie i mean i like it a lot more now because I, I will say one thing this fixes a lot of the problems that I have with Friday the Thirteenth, let's say Friday the Thirteenth, ended like this. Yeah, and they made all these reveals of, oh, I had these strapping young gentlemen help me like lift the bodies on top of deuces and blah 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 blah. If you don't know the plot point to Friday the Thirteenth Part One, I'm sorry for the spoiler. The killer is a senior citizen, and, and I never quite <laughs> bought it all the way. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I still don't. It's just still kind of there. It, it, it's the fact that she had people helping her, you know, do all these actions, you know, and lifting people and putting where they needed to be made this plot more, more believable to me than Friday the 13th part one. I go with the, the excuse of she's crazy and that gives her crazy people strength. Yeah. Or yeah. like the whole mo mother, you know, for, for the power of the love of her child because all this strength or something, you know, yeah. you hear that too. Mother could lift a car off her child. Right. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, you know, to talk about a, another Ken Olin film, uh, Summer School, you know, it's when they're screening Texas Chainsaw Massacre for the class, and they explain to, you know, Gabriella, oh, that's not going to hurt him right now because he's crazy. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's kind of how I take it. Like, yeah, that's fine. But also, Friday the 13th just isn't my favorite Friday the 13th movie by a long shot. It's okay. It's just a Halloween ripoff with a kind of a twist, you know, psycho ending. Which is what bothers me about, you know, people who say, oh, the, these are just, you know, Halloween ripoffs because they're doing different holidays. You say that's a, a ripoff uh, of, of Halloween. You're not entirely wrong in certain aspects, but I think this, this plot is, is much more original than, than Halloween or no, not so much Halloween, but, but Friday the 13th for sure. It's sure. much more original than that. Yeah, it all comes from the wellspring of what holidays have we not made a horror movie about yet? Um, well, let's see. We've already got birthdays. We've got Halloween. We've got Friday the 13th. We've got Christmas. You know, you're just running down the list and it's like, okay, April Fool's Day? Okay, well, how, well, how do we make a slasher movie that isn't just, you know, the, the same slasher movie you've ever seen? You guys fucking love that New Year's Evil film. That that film's problematic all over the place. So I'm, I'm not I'm not a fan. But um, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I've ever seen New Year's Evil. It's it's something where is it? It's just this time zone thing, to where the killer's gonna kill somebody at midnight. You know, in every time zone. But it it doesn't work for me. I, I, I don't know. 
A lot of folks love it, though. I'm not a fan, though. Huh. All right. Well, now, now I feel like I need to see it at, at least. Well, oh, you need to see it once. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay. So she explains what's going on. Rob also is told here's here's what's happening. Oh, oh, and we didn't get to the actual explanation though. It's hey, <laughs> we needed money, so what we're gonna do is we're creating kind of this murder weekend, and this was essentially a dress rehearsal for that to see if you know we put the clues around and and we have some actors and do people buy it like can you actually believe that you know there is a killer on the loose and of course amy still is like yeah it worked i almost killed you and uh yeah so they have to kind of talk rob down uh because he's screaming um in, in another room and I don't pretty quickly after this, like Amy seal is kind of cool with it as is Rob. And I don't know how fast I'm going to make that turn. You know, maybe you do get cool with the fact that the, the host and all of your friends basically played the most horrifying prank on you possible. But it, mm, I don't know, man. That that seems like a, a pretty raw thing to do to somebody. Could be that person with the heart condition that you know they drop dead because they see their friend murdered. And, you know, right? I, not just the the health part of it, but just like how why why did you people who I call my friends not one of you just be like look i know this seems real intense but it's cool like don't don't even worry about it like you're gonna be fine and the whole idea is like like none of them were in on it until the the moment of their murder in quotes where they were told like hey here's what's really going on what one thing i can appreciate is that like you know nobody thought oh that muffy's a real prankster she's gonna pull some stuff on us this weekend gonna give you that clue to say that muffy might pull some stuff but then you'd never get that clue and it's just it's a surprise at the end to say hey hey by the way it's april fool's weekend and i played a joke on you and didn't see that coming did you you know yeah i mean according to some of the trivia there are some hints like she talks about the fact that she's a drama student um you know one of them i was like well i think that's pushing it but the idea uh, that her her fingernails are painted the same color, uh, despite which personality she's supposed to be, and that kind of thing, yep. I'm like, eh, maybe. But it also feels a little bit like a cheat, you know. And that's what bums me out about it is that it, like I said, it's it's the same reaction I have when you find out, like, at the end of the movie that this has all been a dream. Like, I'm not crazy about Jacob's Ladder for that very reason. Of like, oh, yeah, well, Jacob, none of Jacob's this is Jacob's Ladder, that. there's a lot more layers in Jacob's Ladder to make that a, a truthful thing. I mean, this, if you haven't seen Jacob's Ladder again, spoilers, this is all stuff that Jacob is seeing on his deathbed while he's dying in Vietnam, you know? Right. Yeah. Is, is it real? You find out it's, it, it is. It is all what he's seeing. His delusions and while he's dying. Right, but the actual you events know. of the movie don't happen. It's just this, you know, like you said, it's yeah, just a death dream. Oh, and, when you get to the end, though, it, it all makes sense. You know, but by saying, okay, these are things that, these are all the things that are going through his head, you know, yeah. before he's going to die, you know. Yeah, I, I mean, you're not wrong. But also, I, I'm still like, eh, so I you, just you can you can, stre you can stretch those rules is all I'm saying in that sense. Kind of like the Phantasm Chase. You can stretch the rules when you realize you're not sure what's a dream or what's reality. If anything's reality in Phantasm, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, but at least, you're right. But at least Phantasm, there is the question of, okay, some of this might be real. All of this might be real. It's, it's kind of tough to tell. And I don't mind it being vague. The thing that I mean, this is getting into a critique of Jacob's Ladder for no good reason, but I... I Sorry. No, no, no. It, it, it's just a personal preference. I just like a movie that is what I... Ex not expect it to be. Like, I don't mind a movie being not what I expected, but I want 
the events of the movie to be substantial enough that at the end of it, I'm not like, oh, go fuck myself. Um, Because that's kind of how I feel at the end of Jacob's Ladder. Like, it's a well-made movie and all that. It's just a personal thing of, like, I don't like a movie that's a dream. Um, I want I want a movie where actual things happen to people. Um, Are we going to talk about the very ending of this movie? Because this is what, what turns me off of this movie almost every time I watch it. Well, I've only watched it yeah, I agree. a couple times, yeah. but it's... I 100% agree with you that this movie should end right here. That, like, you tell everybody what's going on, everybody has a laugh, everybody drinks some champagne, done and done. That is where this maybe, movie Maybe she, she plays, like, one more prank or something, you know, and, like, one thing to say, hey, yeah, here I go again, be, be, being quirky, and then, like, credits or something. Oh, yeah, like, they, they, you know. toast, they have one more <laughs> toast, it turns out these are dribble glasses, too, everybody has a laugh, credits. That's how this movie ought to end. And instead, though, what happens is that she drunkenly goes to bed later that night, just like staggering up to her bedroom and finds a gift on her bed that is this jack in the box, you know, kind of a callback to the the beginning of the movie. And she starts cranking the jack in the box and when the jack of the box opens up nan um jumps out from behind her and seemingly cuts her throat but then as muffy is like panicking nan shows her like oh no it's not really a, a real knife it's got you know the it, again the tom savini trick of you cut the shape of the neck out so when you press it to someone's throat it just shapes to their neck and there's a bulb underneath that squirts blood yep and then so it you know and nan gives her like a playful little kiss on the cheek like hey got you and then the movie cuts to this jack in the box that winks yeah <laughs> See now, <laughs> while I was watching this, I didn't know that was Nan. She, she, she had a different look on her. I, I thought this might have been the twin that didn't exist or something, you know. Like in um, so it works a little better for me now. It's not, it's not the happy birthday to me ending, which yeah, I, uh, which I will film is okay. But yeah. it's a, I know it's about twenty minutes too long. Though. I'll, I'll lay that out there right now. It's yeah, just, uh... yeah. Uh, we'll we'll talk about happy birthday to me soon enough. Um. But yeah, it, I think this ending is just kind of dumb. Like, I don't think it adds anything to the movie. It doesn't. It doesn't. You know, uh, the only thing I do like, and again, I like the last song that, too bad you're crazy. It's fun. Yeah, it's a yes. fun song. Um, but again, you should have it in the last scene where everybody's gathered together for this celebration, like where Amy Steele realizes that she's been had. And then, you know, call it a day. Play your silly little song and go about your business. Oh, one of the favorite parts of the movie happens just before the reveal happens. And I forgot to mention it. Um, when the guy, I forget the guy's name, the guy with the eye trauma, pulls his appliance off and throws it on a guy's face. Uh, I think it's pretty hilarious. Yeah, I, I, think, I, it, how it happens. I think it's Buck who has the, the appliance. But yeah, as Rob is screaming, he just... <laughs> peels it off and sticks it on his face i uh, like it so i like it a lot yeah it's it's fine <laughs> um so all right let's that and that you know that is the 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 story of april fool's day um let's get into uh the cast um and like i said kind of in the up front i'll i'll spill my tea first but I, I think it's got a really good cast. I think they're, you know, they're having a good time. They seem to get along with one another. I think you can see some actual chemistry between these characters. Um, and I think Amy Steele, at the end of this movie, is is kind of great um, as being the, you know, the, the final survivor along with Rob. Uh, but I also feel that way about Friday the 13th, too. I think she's really good in, in the last act of that movie. Um so yeah, I mean, I, I think it's good. 
two very two very strong characters. You know, two two films. Yeah, yeah, and you know, I mean, you can't go wrong with Tom Wilson as just kind of a goofball. Like he's a he's a funny dude. He was a stand up comic, um, so I think that all works. And I don't know anybody else that we need to call out. Clayton Roner oh. as Chaz, he's fun. Yeah, they're all they they managed to grit uh grit. They managed to grit. They managed to get a cast of, you know, faces that you kinda knew at, at this time almost, you know. Um like I said they've done a couple things already to establish themselves and uh especially now you watch it. I I I always uh crown this movie for having both what I call both Debra's in it because I was getting confused. <laughs> uh Deborah Goodrich and Deborah Foreman because if you, if you pick a movie they're in, I'll probably pick the wrong one that the other one's in. And the fact they're both in this movie, yeah, it kind of fixes that problem for me in yeah. a good way. It's a tale of um, two Debras. It was the, the tale of two Debras, yeah. The best of times. It was um, the worst of times. No, but they all work, man. They're all funny. They're they're all they all play the foil pretty well, you know, when it happens. And uh, get a great scene where Tom Wilson breaks the doorknob he's he's ready for sex he has a mouthful of rubbers and it just these characters work so well in that way and like like you mentioned the one sex scene he's like yeah you open the door and there they are you know folded like a goddamn pretzel and it, yeah uh, like, hey what are we doing we're having a party here man we didn't expect all this death and destruction though <laughs> right right and and they, they play good. They, they play good foils, and like, like I said, I pre- can appreciate that they don't play teenagers. They play like, like young adults, younger adults. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I, you know, some of the stuff again is left really up in the air. Like the the whole deal with, um, uh, Skip as it happens is actually Muffy's twin brother, um, and not in fact a you know a distant cousin and that kind of thing, and um you know like there there's some stuff between him and nikki potentially and all that stuff is just it, like it does ultimately it doesn't matter and that's kind of the the downside of a lot of this movie oh no. skip was in the wraith yo i love the wraith he plays the guy that first gets burnt up in the car Augie, uh, yeah, Augie, yeah yeah Augie, yeah <laughs> yeah um sure enough yeah there's some some wraith action in this but you know there's like all of these actors uh, or most of them popped up in a lot of those 80s movies where you're like, oh yeah, I forgot they're, you know, played a bit part in, you know, Real Genius or something. Um, so, yeah, all, all those characters. Like, uh, I think Deborah Foreman was in Real Genius. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, so... Um, the line about spiking a railroad spike with your penis line, that that girl. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Not right now. Um, yeah. <laughs> So oh, it's good. yeah, it's it, it's a good, talented young cast that carries a lot of the movie off, even when the movie itself doesn't necessarily work all that well. Um, so you know, that's pretty good. They keep you in it. I uh, give them that for 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 that for. It's not over long. It's an hour and twenty eight minutes. So they they keep you in it. The, the young the cast. Yeah. 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 I, I I would agree with that. I think I think that it does a pretty good job of, yeah, of of sort of the the actors propelling the movie more than the plot for sure. Um, all right. Well, let's talk about themes of the movie, which is probably not going to take long, uh, because you know, it's not that complicated. No. Um, but all right. So it's it's a traditional slasher kind of setup so you can uh, it but it because of the type of movie it is that that it's sort of uh, a subversion of that um it's not the typical hey you are if you do drugs if you have sex like you are going to be punished for these moral sins by being murdered the way that a lot of these um, 80s films are it's much more a parody of that stuff and as it such really yeah so it's it's more about I don't know that the movie has anything deep to say other than 
you know what these rules are. Now we're going to break them in in a substantial way that's kind of sneaky. And then at the end, we're going to do it twice for no good reason. The, the, the reveal kind of plays like like, um, like be, behind the mask, the Leslie Vernon movie, uh, in a way for me. But I wish you, you mentioned the, the much darker ending. I wish the darker ending existed. Here's how I think it should have ended. Okay, mm-hmm. go go through with that guy going crazy, and then all of his friends who are still alive, like opening those big doors, and like him being on top of Muffy, who he has murdered for then no reason. Yeah. You know, like the reveal gets to him at last or he doesn't realize the reveal is a thing until the reveal is them opening the door saying, well, you know, what have you done? You know, and th- that would be something for me. If it's uh, maybe Muffy stayed in character. I, I don't know. I- yeah. I'm, I'm right. We're, we're writing a better movie here, but yeah. yeah, no, 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 you're right. Like something would be better than nothing. Like, yeah, it would be, it would be a cool idea if you discovered, you know, Hey, the, that Muffy did not have a twin sister, but she's gone crazy in the process of this and is now, you know, like killing people for real or something like that's something. And it would, it would be nice if that were kind of the twist of the movie, as opposed to surprise, none of this happened. And, and yeah, I, I know I keep coming back to that, but that's the thing that bothers me most about this movie is that it doesn't actually exist you know (laughs) like the movie i saw isn't what really happened yeah um anything else thematically that we need to cover like i said i don't think it's terribly complicated but i also don't want to sell you short Um, no it's not that complicated i just i just like the isolation of it and i think that that's what really makes it work as far as it being a a slasher movie that's not a slasher movie is that you you believe there's no way there's no escape you know all there is woods around them woods that these these kids these young kids or these young adults don't don't know that much about so they can fall into traps or i'm surprised there's not a quicksand scene in this movie somewhere but uh oh right (laughs) yeah yeah uh yeah i was watching cutthroat island recently uh which is never a good idea but uh, oh i i i have I would love for that movie. Probably all the wrong loves, but I love that movie for some reason. Um, I've had to watch it a couple of times, <laughs> and it's rough. That is a rough <laughs> sit. Probably, probably Frank Langella is probably my love for that movie. Frank Langella is amazing in it, but the rest of the movie around him is not yeah, very it's like a, it's a mess. I, yeah, on paper it, it should be exciting, and it just it's long. It's, it's like two and a half hours long or something, dude. It feels that way, but it's not. It's like 204. It it feels like it is way longer than it is. I agree with I you. I think it was over two hours. I knew it. And yeah. I'm sorry for talking about Cutthroat Island on this horror podcast. I know. I brought it up. You brought up Quicksand, and I was like, oh, right, that Matthew Modine scene where he's stuck in Quicksand. It's probably the best scene of the movie, quite frankly. Um, yeah, so, you know, you kind of started in on this, but let, let's just kind of finish up our our sort of final thoughts of the movie um i think the movie is pretty fun it just doesn't have any bite to it because it can because it doesn't really happen and on a on a disc related note i watched this on the uh, the scream factory disc uh that they did and it's a great transfer like this movie has never looked better The music is really good. It's shot really well. Um, The biggest problem with the movie is that it doesn't have any... Doesn't have any bite to it at all. And the the very ending of the movie is really dumb. And But also, it's hard to imagine that it could be good given the sort of number of endings and the way that this movie was kind of chopped up in the editing. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know how you fix that problem other than just to do a darker movie, which is not what the studio wanted to do. So, you know, Fred Walton and team were kind of hamstrung by the idea of like, well, Paramount's telling them to release a a 
jokey, fun time, good natured slasher movie. Uh huh. And you know, I think that most horror fans don't really want that. It, it's kind of interesting as a curiosity, I think, of like, oh, well, here's here's a movie that kind of subverts the idea of a slasher movie, but I don't know that it's a, it's a good example of that, but it doesn't necessarily make for that great a movie, I, mean, I think. I, mean, I can see why it didn't make a whole lot. I mean, because that, that has to be heartbreaking as a director to say, well, here's your idea. Let's just put that shit aside and let's make this happy-go-lucky thing with this ending that you're not going to like because we didn't mention this but this is the guy that directed what a stranger calls yeah and probably gave us 25 minutes of probably the most suspenseful cinema you're ever going to watch i can't the whole movie's great but you know you know have you checked the children you know all that Mm -hmm. you know all that for a reason because the suspense is there you know and they're selling carol kane and he's selling that you know yeah that is really good uh, I don't. I agree with you. I don't think the whole movie is great, but that opening sequence is just it's iconic. The best, yeah. It is, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. I think you're right. Like, I think it's kind of a bummer that maybe the movie Fred Walton wanted to make, and and granted, it was always going to be kind of jokey, but doing a hard turn where like, oh, all of a sudden this movie got kind of mean spirited, I think would work in its favor. You hear so much about this, too. You hear about, like, and I know JB defends this constantly, the Nightmare remake. Mm-hmm. Yeah, those guys went in wanting to make a whole other kind of movie. And then that was taken from them. They had to make this, this, what, what happened with it, you know? <laughs> it's just kind of there. But, um, that and the thing, the thing prequel, those guys want to make a whole other kind of movie, too. And that was taken from them. Mm-hmm. So this has been happening and still happening, apparently. And I think it's uh, Alfred Decker and the Predator. Uh, uh, yeah, you want to make a whole other movie too? I, I would love to see that movie. That's all. That's all I'm saying. You know. Yeah, yeah, you're you're right. Um, but you know, this is the movie we got, and it's time to score it. Uh, as always, a uh, scale of one to five. Uh, half stars are allowed. No quarter stars because we are not monsters here. So where where do you land with April Fool's Day? Oh, it's, it's a three. It's it's not it's not perfect, but it's not middle of the road either. I'm mean, like I said, the characters keep you in it. I think the score is really good. Mm-hmm. I, I think that's really good in the movie. And um, the, the reveal at the end will will take you out of it if you have a brain like mine, though. And that's 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 junk for to say. I don't have to watch this film for a very long time. And I haven't. I haven't watched it in a very long time, except for this show. And it, you, it could pick any film that you're doing for these next four films. And I could say, hey, you know what? That needs a redemption watch. Because a lot of them, I'm not a huge fan yeah. of. Probably because I saw one of those in, with the with the sloppy special effects in there. You know what I'm talking about. They, they, they restored it since to mm-hmm. make it look better. But that's the first time I saw that movie. <laughs> it looks sloppy. I'm like, well, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, I agree with you. I'm I'm gonna go three stars as well. Uh, I think that it is a a decent movie. I think the cast really elevates it, and I, I've really gotten fond of that last, not the very last scene, but the last scene where Amy Steele, you know, opens the doors and everybody's there, and you get the explanation. And I wish if this had been a half hour episode of something and that were the reveal, I'd be like, oh, that's great. But the fact that you have to spend an hour, you know, hour 20 getting to that moment is that's that's where I feel like it's a bit of a cheat. But I would still kind of recommend it. Like if you've never seen April Fool's Day, it's, you know, especially if you can watch a really good transfer of it, uh, which, you know if you get it on one of the streaming services, it's probably that same HD transfer and it looks good. And it's, uh, you know, the characters are fun enough and, uh, and Amy Steele, you know, I, I think I may be slowly, but surely becoming the kind of person that's like, you know what? Amy Steele is really one of the unsung, uh, kind of scream Queens of, uh, of, of the eighties. 
and um, you know, you could do a lot worse. Um, interestingly, this this doesn't have anything to do with the movie itself, really. But I've been reading um, Men, Women, and Chainsaws, and which okay. which is kind of the feminist uh, read of a lot of slasher movies. And I gotcha. this is one of those movies that kind of seems like an exception to that, where even though you have a final girl, because nobody, because you're not seeing any of the murders, and because you're not having this kind of final girl confrontation in the film, that is really unusual in the world of these 80s slashers. And that alone kind of makes it an interesting footnote in 80s horror history even if it's not necessarily the most successful movie as a whole definitely Uh, unique that's for sure yeah yeah uh all right well let's do the uh three things that you might not know about uh this here movie april fool's day so there is a novelization of this movie gary uh, by a guy named Jeff Rovin and it was supposed to come out alongside the theatrical release but the novel or the novelization of the screenplay is the original ending where everybody ah, sneaks nice. back <laughs> and and also um, Skip, the reason he wants to kill Muffy is to get his share of the family m- money but he fails and ends up dead himself. Mm. But apparently a lot of this was actually shot because there are stills of the, uh, of the scenes from the movie, but there's no actual film of it, you know, it's yeah. just, uh, just the stills. And yeah, but there is like, that was part of the original script, which made it to the novelization and then uh, was, was cut out. Some of these old novelizations are very interesting because let's say you get like the, the Nightmare on Elm Street Part Three novelization, they have a lot of those scripts that were unused. They have plot points in there from those scripts within that novelization, and there's a lot of a lot of those novel, novelizations like that. And if there's some kind of a PDF file that somebody could point me to to read some of these, I would certainly appreciate that. But um, they're they're very expensive some of these novelizations. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I was talking to Court this very day about uh, him wanting a, a copy of Halloween Two, which apparently is very pricey on the uh, the secondhand market. So yeah, um, that's I used shame. to have it too. I know I used to have it. Yeah, that's that's a bummer. Uh, all right, so number two. In the, the list of things you may not know about uh, about April Fool's Day, uh, Fred Walton, the director, cites this movie as one of the reasons that he stopped doing major movies in Los Angeles. Even though this movie was filmed on Vancouver Island, but it, you know the, it all started in L.A. And it's because um, he and his wife were on Vancouver Island and they, they were planning a family. And his wife was like, you know what? Everybody on this island is so nice. I just don't want to raise our kids in L.A. And so he agreed, and they moved outside of Los Angeles. And so that was the reason that he kind of left mainstream Hollywood production, was because they went to this lovely town in British Columbia that his wife kind of fell in love with and convinced him. Uh, you know, you should stop making Hollywood movies and we should go, uh, you know, some to some nice little town and raise our kids. If you have the means and you want to live your best life, you know, more power to you, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's kind of how I felt about it. Like, he's done some TV movies and stuff uh, since then, but, you know, those are probably like, hey, you know, we're going to send you to Canada for two weeks to shoot this thing. Um, but you know, like you said, if, if if you can swing it, that sounds like a, a pretty good life to me. Um, all right. So then, the third and final thing that you may not know about April Fool's Day is that uh, the movie had a snake wrangler, Gary, because obviously there was a snake. 
Mm -hmm. But he had a bunch of snakes, not just the one you saw in the movie. And the snake wrangler kept all of those snakes that he brought in his hotel room, specifically in Mm -hmm. the bathtub. Yep. And the story goes that a housekeeper came into the room while he was away to clean the room opened uh, the curtains on the shower and found a tub full of snakes and that snake wrangler was then uh, forced to find yet another hotel to stay in yes (laughs) because he was not allowed uh, to continue his stay because of the bathtub full of snakes so I have the Jake the Snake Roberts podcast, and you know that's where Jake the Snake kept his snakes on the road. It was in the hotel bathtubs, you know. Yeah, I think you, you're supposed to tell somebody. Yeah, is is but the then again, you know, cocaine's a hell of a drug, though. So that's uh, he doesn't do that now, people. Um, but yeah, so that that is April Fool's Day to kick off our uh, '80s horror extravaganza, Gary. Thank you, as always, for doing this, man. I really appreciate it. It went a lot better than I thought I was going to, so there's that. Yeah, it, it's a good time. Thank you. <laughs> and where can people find more out of you? Well, when, when I'm recording shows, which is, I've been devoid the last few weeks, but I'm, I'm going to get back into it again because we're pulling up on our eighth year of inconsistent broadcasting mm-hmm. for a Cinebeef podcast. Um, we're doing all the CRISPR guest films. Um, coming up for that month and nothing horror unfortunately but I'll kick that into horror gear uh, next month after that but uh, I got a cast of, of, of characters for, for those shows and including including you Bo yeah. I'm going to make that, that drawing real soon I think tonight I'm going to do it because I have, I have some time to kill tonight so keep an eye on what your, your pick is going to be um, yeah that that's all happening um, stuff that's coming back Last Call of Torchies record on Sunday uh, with Bruce's Millions and with the the bonus Patreon show, The Toy, which should be, I don't know which conference is more interesting, The Toy or Bruce's Millions, but I'd imagine The Toy will be. Yeah, uh, I mean, that's... So nothing, to do with, nothing to do with Walter Hill, but there's it's problematic, but it's still a film that I, I find heartwarming and enjoyable, you know? Um, uh, yeah. Burning for... Oh, I'm, is... sorry. Burning, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. It... No, I was just going to say, The Toy is absolutely one of those movies we've talked about doing on um, Pick 6 Movies. Mm-hmm. And each time it has come up, it's like, there. it is just so... There are just too many landmines in that movie. Like, the, the whole conversation would be, holy shit, this is racist. Well, yeah, yeah, you know. It's, 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 it's strange, and there's that, and... But I think it's... It, 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 you know, it gets to it. It gets to the heartwarming stuff, and um, yeah, it, it's, but yeah, it's 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 it would never be made now. Let's put it that way. <laughs> oh no no no! Uh, Burning for Spring was coming back. So close out the, the the next season, the the first season of the show, and move on to the second season. That is our Friday's Nightmare show with Suzanne and Mike Merriman. Um, two treatment commentaries. I tried the booking thing for that, so I think I have a group of, of three, myself and two other solid people to do it with, and we'll just to keep keep it tight and get episodes out, and that's, uh, that's the biggest bitch about this business of scheduling people, and scheduling's hard sometimes, oh, yeah. you know, <laughs> and then frustration yeah. kicks in, but whatever. These shows can all be found at legionpodcast.com. I do a show with Heather Powell. On the Dark Discussions Network. I mean, I mean, I mean, I'm sorry. Intestinal Fortitude Podcast Network. Sorry, Android virus. Uh, called Untapped Gems. That's on a little hiatus because she's um, had some work obligations and then she's going on a small vacation. So when she's done with all that, that show will be back with episode three, uh, being the Devil's Backbone. And those are all films that we have not seen before. So that, uh, that's that's oh, the whole theme wow. of that show. Just uh, breaking that vein on that that shame list, and it's 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 a good time. Yeah, yeah, Devil's Backbone's real good. You're gonna enjoy that. But um, yeah, that's about it, though. You know, it's, it's, uh, so many ideas, so little time. You know. Oh sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, all right, man. 
Well, thanks for doing this, and uh, I'll be right back to close out the show, so uh, stay tuned. And there you have it. That is the discussion uh, from Gary and I. I uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I had a really good time talking about that movie. Um, as you heard, I, I have my complaints with it, but you know, it's fun to do those deep dives on these kinds of movies because there generally is a pretty good story behind them. And I think that will be true. Next week, we're going to be talking about Happy Birthday to Me with Quartz Iops, and I think you're going to find uh, that conversation is also fairly illuminating when it comes to why the end of that movie is the way that it is, much like April Fool's Day being a little bit of uh, producer tampering in some ways. Um, so thanks uh, for listening. Thanks for participating. As always, uh, if you would like to uh, you know, rate and review where you get your podcast, that certainly helps the show. Also, if you go to uh, youtube.com forward slash Legion Podcasts, you can not only uh, find a video version of this podcast and give it a thumbs up because that helps a lot, but you can also join us for Sinister Sundays. That is announced on the Facebook uh, group for the Dark Parade as well as uh, at Dark Parade Pod on Twitter to let you know, hey, there's going to be a Sinister Sunday this week generally been on about a once a month once every two weeks kind of schedule so keep an eye out for that but that's really fun it's just an opportunity to hang out answer some questions and do some general uh, tomfoolery and uh, that'll do it for this episode uh, as always thank you for listening thank you for sharing the show around and most importantly thank you for joining the dark parade we'll see you next time <laughs>